Let's see if we can pull this off. This is new technology for everybody. So uh, there he is. Ta da! Ta da! As if by magic. Oh, man. You have no idea. <laughs> so good to see you. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? You look fantastic. Yeah, pretty fantastic. All things considered, you know, really, things are great. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm very happy to uh, very happy to see your face. Obviously, we've been talking quite a bit, yes. uh, as, as we always do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I guess for some reason, we just haven't done it over video. So uh, no, that's true. You know what? We usually just use the telephone. I know. Oh, hang on. Tony says hi. Tony is my barber. So oh. on uh, on today. <laughs> Throw it out. What do you think? <laughs> On today's episode of What the Hell Is My Hair Doing? Uh, <laughs> we have this. So thank you very much for uh, for joining me, uh, Michael. I, I know this is all uh, new technology, um, slightly weird. I'm still getting to grips with it as well myself. Um, but it seems like a good idea to have a sort of a live discussion between you and I. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, Michael Johnson is in the house. Johnson Banks Design, wonderful. Uh, yes, Michael is uh, an incredible designer. He's done a lot of logos that uh, a lot of people will be very familiar with, uh, including my own. So oh, that's uh, amazing. I really dig your logo. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think I ever mentioned that to you, but uh, I really do. Thank you very much. I can't claim any credit other than having the initials I do. Um, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And, you know, finding the right designer. There is that as well. Um, yes, so uh, this is a question and answer session. So uh, I'm going to jump right in the Hello Boutique Guitar Showcase. Um, first of all, Michael, uh, it, it occurred to me, um, I mean, we, I think we first met in 2009 at the Montreal Guitar Show. Uh, that was the first time that we met face to face. Mm -hmm. But I have memories of exchanging messages with you over MySpace. So that's uh, that's how far back. <laughs> when, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. When dinosaurs roamed the earth. And it also uh, it also occurred to me that you were actually um, the very first luthier I ever interviewed. Really? Going, yeah, going all the way back to a night in London in a in a hotel. And uh, I think we just oh, had a meeting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that, I think that, that interview is obviously long gone, but uh, it suddenly dawned on me. I was like, I've, I've been interviewing you for quite some time. So here we go again. <laughs> here we go again. <laughs> now, uh, more of the same. Even more of the same. But people seem to enjoy it. So here we are. <laughs> uh, the first question I have for you, um, and I think this is, uh, this is going to be interesting for a lot of the, the younger guys out there on Instagram. Um, you started off before, you know, decades as a successful guitar builder. You started off as, as a guitar repairer. Um, now, that brought you into contact with all manner of interesting vintage and just weird instruments. What, what sort of foundation did those years uh, provide you as a guitar builder? Uh, it, it's actually a topic that I'm passionate about and I speak about quite often. Uh, I think it's critical. If somebody really wants to be a great instrument maker, not just guitar, I think a, an enormous amount of repair work, and, and maybe not so much even repair work, although it's important that I'll get to why it's important in a moment, but servicing the needs of the player mm. you know the violin adjuster it, it's arguable that the violin adjuster is even more important than the maker because they'll take a very good instrument and, and they'll be able to you know fine tune the sound post and make adjustments to the bass bar and the mass under the fingerboard or you know by adding or 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 uh, removing slight adjustments to the neck angle to really dial in the voice of the instrument and the playability of the instrument to that artist. Mm -hmm. And the same really holds true in the guitar. Having done years of, you know, uh, yes, repair work, but adjusting instruments for players, whether it's a jazzer or a rock guy, 
or a, a grunge guy back in the 90s and metal guys and uh, uh, country cats, mm -hmm. you know, rock guitarists. All those different genres have different requirements and as far as the setup of the instrument is concerned. And having entered into many conversations with those players, you begin to develop a profound understanding of what their needs are from these tools. Right. Because as romantic as they want to be, at the end of the day, this is a tool for making music. And that same sensitivity translates into what I do with modern fingerstyle players and singer songwriters, mm -hmm. and studio cats, and, and whatever it is. So first and foremost, being able to address the needs of the player and having an understanding how to do that mm -hmm. really informs my being able to craft an instrument for the player. And for those who have, uh, who are and who who are and are soon to be customers of mine, they know that we spend a good deal of time talking. I have an uh, extensive questionnaire that I go through, right. usually by Zoom or by telephone or Skype or something, and it's like ninety minutes, easily. And I ask a lot of questions, and basically, the customer ends up telling me exactly what it is that they want, and then within my bag of tricks and repertoire of instruments that I make, hopefully I am able to, you know, score and deliver them the instrument that they, they really want. Absolutely. The second, the, sorry, the second part of the answer is having come across so many failed instruments because, <laughs> right. and not necessarily catastrophic fails, but the realities of the rigors of, being on the road. What mm. happens to an instrument after 20, 30, 50, 100 years? Uh, how do soundboards move? What are the situations where braces pop right. uh, or backs fracture? Um, why do neck angles change? How do you hopefully engineer that out of your own work? And then, of course, when it does happen, how do you engineer your instrument so that the repairer, wherever they may be down the road, somewhere on the planet, is going to have a relatively easy time or the easiest possible time in adjusting it? Because let's mm. face it, these objects are made out of wood and wood reacts to temperature and humidity. And exactly. although we do the best that we can to engineer a stable instrument, sometimes shit happens as, as they say yeah and you know i'm fortunate i'm i've made more than 320 guitars and i don't know there's like three or four that i'm aware of that i've had to set the neck on or uh one i sent to a friend of mine in new york to have a neck reset so you know fingers crossed it seems like i'm doing a good job as far as that's concerned <laughs> Well, it, it's arguably uh, a, a fantastic foundation um, for a, a career as a builder. You, you did mention um, addressing the needs of uh, a specific player, which is obviously a, a vital part of what you do. Uh, one of those specific players is, uh, has joined us online. Uh, Pipo Romero is, oh. uh, is right here. Hi, Pipo. Uh, <laughs> ¿Cómo estás, hermano? Um, I was wondering uh, if you'd like to speak a little bit about the process of, of making a guitar for, for people who obviously has very unique uh, requirements as an instrumentalist. It, it, it's, that was a heavy sigh, but it wasn't the bad sigh. It's people in many ways is very easy to make an instrument for. Uh, the reason being a musician on people's level knows exactly what he wants. Right. And he told me exactly what he wants. Of, of course, part of it was that he came across one of my instruments pre-owned and mm -hmm. bought it, his first G3. And he had an opportunity to explore and become intimate with that guitar. And that was the foundation. Right. So then it was really the next steps. I really like this guitar, but I would like more of this, less of this. Mm. My right hand needs this, my left hand needs that. And uh, P 
people on his own, because of course we do our job, but then the rest is up to the musician, uh, discovered the string gauging that works best for him to find the proper balance for the tunings that he uses. Mm -hmm. And I actually just finished stringing up his second guitar, <laughs> so which I know he's very anxious to get, but <laughs> nobody's flying anywhere these days. So uh, Not right now. Oh, wow, that, that's fantastic. I, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I, I guess already having a, a frame of reference mm -hmm. from your work right. uh, meant that he was able to uh, not only um, not only state his requirements but contextualize them within that framework. Right. You know? So, uh, yeah, I can I can see that being uh, being very very helpful. That does bring me to uh, another question, actually, Michael. Um, obviously, you you have a full list. You yeah. make a lot of guitars in painstaking, exquisite detail. Um, how do you maintain time for research and development and new ideas? Um, it's, it's an ongoing process on, and it's multifaceted. Part of it is, you know, going to museums. When, whenever I'm traveling, uh, mm -hmm. for business or otherwise, if I'm in a new city, uh, or even some cities that I've visited multiple times and I have an opportunity to spend a half a day or a day at a musical instrument museum, uh, and sometimes I'll do it with dear friends. Ken Parker and I spent way too much time at the museum in uh, Berlin one year. But if you want to develop something, anything, I always feel that you have to look backwards first. There's really very little that is truly new. And the best place to learn is by looking at the past. Uh, that also, I, go, I guess, goes back to the first question about the repair world. That was school for me. That was an opportunity because of the restoration work I did to have my nose and inspection mirror inside of early 20th century Washburns and golden era Martins and pre-war Gibsons and Larson brother guitars, and, you know, 19th century Martins. And part of what you learn is just sometimes it's an old guitar. Right. <laughs> and, and that's where it ends. But the truly great ones, when you when they come across your your workbench, like my aha moment, and I've said this many times, but my aha moment was in 1929 OM 28, and that guitar came across my workbench, and I went, okay, I I understand why everybody makes such a big fuss over this. So then the challenge to me was to try and understand why people make a fuss out of this, mm -hmm. what is so special about the voice that people covet. And then, of course, through careful examination of many of those instruments, try and understand what those craftspeople of, well, close to 100 years ago now, what their methodology was, of course, predicated on already a century of empirical experience in the C.F. Martin company. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just like some guy had an idea. There was, you know, <laughs> decades of careful testing and documenting and at the time, you know, their own scientific method. And they steered the voice of the guitar in that direction. So we can take that archaeological approach by examining old instruments or any great instrument. It doesn't have to be an old instrument. And do our best to understand how the maker steered the physical parameters of the instrument to deliver the voice that was requested by the player. So fast forward to where I'm at now, when I'm not at a museum, uh, I'm doing a lot of work in different areas, always, always, always. We, I have always kept at least three different journals of data, coming mm -hmm. back to my very first guitar. Uh, I still do. And now, you know, inspired by the work of Brian Gallup uh, and many in the violin community, I'm looking at the physical properties of wood. I'm looking at the acoustic physics of the instrument and how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, 
thank you to Irvin Samaji for lighting that fire under my ass. <laughs> but, you know, often I have young makers who ask me, how do you do this and that? And, you know, I always hesitate to give the answer, not because I don't want to give the answer. But, you know, if I say, well, you do blah, mm. they have no knowledge. They have no understanding. I think that you really have to do the work to understand what it is that you've yeah. taken from the situation. And then you can take that knowledge and apply it to your work now and in the future. So for the last couple of years, as I said, I've been measuring the mechanical and acoustic properties of, of spruce. Mm. And you know, I build a couple dozen guitars a year. So we now have a data set of some 50 guitars. And you can look at the data all the way through the process to the time where you string up the instrument. And after 50 guitars, and more than likely after maybe 100 guitars, I'll be starting to have a more profound understanding of how this wonderful instrument we call the guitar works Mm -hmm. And hopefully I'll be able to use that information to build more consistent guitars and deliver an instrument with a voice even closer to that which the client, you know, wanted. Absolutely. So, my, so I guess the short answer is my research is ongoing. Mm -hmm. It never stops. Having and as well, because as you mentioned, I have, you know, a three year waiting list. Um, I schedule two guitars a year for myself. And sometimes it's just a project that I want to noodle around with. Um, sometimes it's a project that I'm just trying something scientific um, and it ends up getting run through the bandsaw at the end. <laughs> you know, uh, right now, for instance, last year, it, it, and because it's not a priority, I sort of do it in drips and drabs. Mm. Uh, I finished painting it, believe it or not, before Christmas last year. It still doesn't have strings on it. <laughs> but hopefully that's going to happen uh, next week after we get back to work. The, it's, it's a project I've been thinking about for several years. The entire guitar is made out of Port Orford cedar. Right, yeah, you sent me a picture of that. Yeah, everything. Top, <laughs> back, sides, neck, peghead. They had underlay, it, just like everything is poor for cedar. Wow. I, I just, I don't know. I, I really like that that timber and, and the way it sounds and the way it smells. And I thought, what happened if I make an entire guitar? So, exactly. you know, so sometimes it's like hard science and data. And sometimes it's just whimsical and fun. So mm -hmm. some of it is scheduled and some of it is just part of my process. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have been joined by uh, an Instagram account. I don't think it's an official Instagram account uh, from the tree mahogany. <laughs> oh, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, who, could, who could that be? Who could that be? I have no idea. Um, you are one of a select few luthiers who has built extensively with this wood. I'm not just talking one or two show pieces but we're like a decade of experience or more with the tree. What can you tell us about this fabled, extremely rare wood? It's fabled, it's extremely rare, it's gorgeous, it's mahogany. And I have a habit of being controversial and saying things that, you know, piss people off, but- That's kind of why we're here. Why, why stop now, right? Um, <laughs> No, I, I absolutely love the material. People shouldn't fool themselves. Uh, it's, it's really, really good mahogany. Mm. This is Belizean mahogany. You, you know, that, that wonderful old growth stuff that probably remnants of what wasn't cut down centuries before. Uh, it's the type of mahogany that CF Martin Company was using during the golden era. Mm. But it's mahogany. Right. Now, I think that scientifically, well, not scientifically, but mechanically, there is an advantage to the quilt figure. Mm. And the fact that the figure of the wood is quilted 
basically it means that it ruins the integrity of the, it, it's not straight grain quarter song. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. you have end grain coming this way and that way. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it makes the whole system more compliant. Right. So it, it slightly changes the way the back moves, I think in a good way. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's mahogany. It sounds like a mahogany guitar. The right. advantages to it are it's beautiful. The reality is that a good portion of the people who commission work from me are high net worth individuals who are looking for the absolute best. And mm. this is, I think, no one will argue one of the top five most precious woods on the planet. It's finite. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the golden era of the tree, it, we're still in it, but... I don't think there's that much more to be found. It was, mm -hmm. to the best of our knowledge, a single timber that was fell in the rainforest. Right. A decade later, it got dragged out. Uh, it ended up being milled in Florida, I think somewhere in Miami, but let's just say Florida. And then, you know, it got milled into lumber and made architectural furniture and other furniture and some guitars. And then certain individuals, mainly one man in particular, Jay, mm -hmm. uh, has spent a lifetime, you know, wrangling tree and uh, making tree it- Tree wrangler. Well, he well, is the tree wrangler. And, you know, he's made this, this beautiful wood available to us to mm -hmm. preserve the rainforest in the form of bespoke instruments. Well, absolutely. I think it's extremely unlikely that we'll see another example like this because you get the sensation that like true old growth natural mahogany this thing's had to fight its way through the canopy this this was a survivor yeah. you know this this went all the way through to get the light that it needed and and you get a real sense of of power just handling the stuff you know mm -hmm. that's what i that's what i love about it okay well thank you very much for that um here's another question which i guess is tangential uh in a way but but i think it's germane to the issue uh those of us who uh, who know you well, Michael, associate you with um, a rich level of experience, <laughs> I think it's fair to say, uh, life experience from, from all are, are, manner. Are we allowed to talk about that here? <laughs> <laughs> all manner of things. So. Um, but but an, also an absolute refusal to compromise on the things that, that matter to you. Um, how does that translate to your approach uh, to life as, as a guitar maker? Uh, I think it, it, it's my life in general. And I think who we are as people come through in our work. Mm -hmm. um, as far as my life in a guitar maker, as a guitar maker, rather, uh, you know, we have a, a, a motto in my workshop that perfect is acceptable. And that, pro you know, of course, we're human beings and we make things with our hands. And our objective is to get things as close to perfect as we can. Mm -hmm. I made a decision to address the upper end of the market. And because of that is my responsibility to deliver an instrument that is the very best work that I am humanly capable of every single time. Right. And I, compromise is just not an option. You know, I, 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 in the past, have had a number of apprentices for a period of, I don't know, 12, 15 years, something like that. And and now Julianne is with me and has been for the last four years and change. And, you know, work, I, I'm always telling myself this, and I tell Julianne and everybody before him, you know, when we see something, because let's not fool ourselves, guitar making is not perfect, and any guitar maker who's watching or any one of the viewers who has spoken to guitar maker will let you know a huge part of our job is being able to correct all of the little oopsies that happen right. along the way. <laughs> so the bottom line is, I said, if, if I spent, like, at the end of the day, notwithstanding the price of my instruments, I'm a guitar maker, hmm. you know? And if I spent 4,000 or 6,000 or $10,000 on a guitar and I saw this blemish, I would be pissed off. Never mind the guy who's spending 20 or 30 or $40,000. And frankly, today we can buy 
you know, import guitars for 1500 US dollars, a thousand US dollars, I mean, fit and finish is pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, compromise, th there is no compromise. Our work has to arrive at the customer and it has to thoroughly impress, if not blow away, all of the factory gar guitars or we've failed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, compromise. And, and, you know, many years ago in another lifetime in the hospitality industry, uh, I, I Lee Iacocca, who once upon a time CEO of Chrysler. Mm. And he had a great saying. He says, we have to, you have to lead, follow, or get out of the way. So. Absolutely right. <laughs> Absolutely right. Uh, Michael, how are you doing for battery? Uh, I, th I, I don't know. I think my battery. Let me see. I don't know how to check. Like this, I think my battery has. Hold on, sorry if you. No, that's okay. Let's have a. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll just play some instrumental music. Yeah, I'm still here. How are you doing? Oh, All good. Okay, good. Can you see me? Uh, you you've got a bit dark on me. Up oh, there. Okay. Uh, there you are. Just That's in time to say hello set. to <laughs> those people. <laughs> this um, is not as easy as we make it look, Romero. I right. promise no, you. No, <laughs> my battery. I, I, my battery is fine. I've got that set. Excellent. Battery. Good. I'm, I'm delighted How to hear it. You? Yes. Oh, I'm I'm good. I'm plugged in. I, I yeah. I, I <laughs> I'm wired up to the mains. Joy of live stream says uh, Louis Monto guitars, and he's not wrong. Thank you, Hugh Price. Um, next question, Michael. Um, <laughs> This, this this is one for I guess people who who might know the other side uh, of of your um, previous lives, of which you've had several. Um, but mm -hmm. what what advice would you have for aspiring disco slash funk guitarists? <laughs> it's all about the one, to quote the great James uh, James Brown. <laughs> It's all about the one, I don't know, listen to a lot of Nile Rogers and Louis Shelton, listen to the great James Jamerson, mm -hmm. uh, Ray Parker Jr. You know, listen to that stuff and get it inside of you and then the rest is easy. Oh, well, there you go. You see, uh, not a lot of people know this, but, but Michael was a phenomenal, as still is, phenomenal disco, funk and, and soul guitarist uh, who enjoys P90s, fuzz pedals and a uh, clon centaur. <laughs> so, um, at the very least and and remember if you don't have to reach above your head to adjust the volume treble and bass your amp is too small too small <laughs> <laughs> um mike you've, you've created guitars for many of the world's finest players let's see uh, keith richards tony mcmanus um people romero andy mckee and uh adam miller he's got one coming in as well yeah. um is there any, well, yes, which musician, living or dead, would you most like to, uh, to build a guitar for? Ooh. You know, I'd like people always ask me this question, and it's so hard to answer. I, I mean, the, uh, it, it, this is all fantasy, of course. But of course. Th the obvious one would be, you know, the great Michael Hedges. That would have been cool. Mm -hmm. um, if Herbie Hancock played the guitar, I would love to sweet. make a guitar for him. Uh, Sir Paul McCartney, mm. that would be pretty cool. Uh, Johnny Mitchell. Oh, yeah. John Baez. It's difficult, isn't it, narrowing it down to one? <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, was I only supposed to give you one? Well, yeah. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm... Herbie Hancock. Herbie Hancock, nice. <laughs> You, like we've been talking about making a guitar for you for like over a decade. I'm oh, saying. I'd love that. <laughs> well, you don't make archtops anymore, so I'm sad. No. 
um, I do have, uh, obviously, I, I put this out to, um, to my Instagram guys and, and said, look, send me some, uh, send me some questions through. Um, some of them we've already addressed. Some of them were things like, what's your favorite guitar? <laughs> <laughs> which which were you know perhaps a, a little difficult to uh um to really get our teeth into um inevitably people are fascinated by your long relationship with one of the highest profile acoustic guitarists that's ever lived uh mr andy mckee mm -hmm. and i mean I, I love andy to tiny bits <laughs> um you know the the music that he makes with, with your instruments is, is inspiring and he's an incredible ambassador and, a, and uh, a spokesperson for your work. How did the, uh, how did the relationship begin? Oh, um, Andy and I go back, I don't remember the years exactly. It was before 2004 probably 2002, 2003, we met at the Canadian Guitar Festival. He was mm -hmm. a long haired kid giving music lessons in a music store in Topeka, Kansas. And he came to compete in Canadian guitar competition thingy. And there was a little guitar show as part of the guitar festival. I don't know, maybe a dozen guitar makers, acoustic, electric, otherwise. And Andy stopped by my table and played my guitar and it was all there. You know, it was like, oh my mm -hmm. God. What? So I, he was playing some kind of a guild, I think, if I remember. And uh, I said, you know, hey man, if you're ever interested in a guitar, let's talk, you know, mm -hmm. try and find some way that we can make this happen that's good for both of us. And he kind of said, yeah, okay, that's great. And, you know, then through the community, guys like Don Ross and Pierre Bensoussan and Tony McManus, and, you know, they're, they're all part of this circle. And because some of these people are my friends and customers, it's like this incestuous family thing and everybody knows everybody. So Andy and my path continued to cross for several years. And there was never really a discussion of a guitar ever again. Mm. So I kind of forgot about it because guitars are very intimate, personal things. And the only thing that really matters is what the player likes. It doesn't matter what I think. It, it, you know, people, any guitarist knows you pick up a guitar and you connect with it. And there are other guitars that you really want to connect with and it just doesn't happen. And mm. I've had guitars like that where, you know, you've had them for a decade and there's just... You tried your best, there's nothing there. So I figured, okay, but it, I'm not his thing. It, and that was, that was okay, that was totally fine. Anyway, he and Don Ross were touring together. I'm just trying to remember the year. I think it was maybe 2006, maybe 2007. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, Don would always call me from the road when he was like an hour out of Montreal driving somewhere. He said, hey, we're all coming through. You want to grab dinner? So I said, sure, let's meet at such and such a restaurant. And we did uh, one night in uh, a neighborhood called the Mile End here in Montreal at a popular Indian restaurant. And we're all sitting around. Brooke, Brooke Miller was there and, and Don was there and Andy was there. And I was there. I don't think Judy was there. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. So, you know, we were, we were talking and uh, what do guitarists talk about? They talk about gear. And it has been known. It, it has been done before. <laughs> so I asked Andy, you know, so what are you playing these days? He said, oh, I'm playing, and, and like no ulterior motive because I had already, it was done, right? So just out of curiosity, what are you playing these days? And he said, I'm playing, you know, an Avalon. And it wasn't, mm -hmm. uh, it, he said, nah, not really particularly thrilled with it, looking for something else. I said, oh, what do you, what would you like? Like, what are you considering? He said, oh, I really like one of your guitars. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. 
we could we could talk about that. Of course, at the mm -hmm. dinner table with everybody else present wasn't the time, but we <laughs> arranged the time. I, we arranged the time to talk, you know, discreetly, mm -hmm. and we did. And I made him his first G four, and he's pretty much been playing this. Uh, uh, I mean, I've made him several, but mm. the same G four spec the same way since day one. And uh, every time I make him a new guitar, you know, what do you want to change? Mm. You know, because he's out there on the road playing a couple hundred dates a year all over the planet. It's like, what's working for you? What isn't working for you? And he said, no, it's, it's good. Don't change anything. So this year, finally, after, I don't know, 12, 13 years, we introduced two signature Andy McKee models. One yeah. is exactly the guitar he makes, he plays. And the other one is the no frills version. You know, mm. same, same model, same fan frets. Uh, no embellishment, no embellishment, no bevels, you know, but right. the mechanical guitar is, is the same. As, as far as I understand it, the only real uh, change since that first G4 um, has been losing the sound port, right? There were two changes. Losing the sound port, I, I stopped, and that's an interesting story. I, I stopped making, I stopped offering sound ports on my guitars very soon after my tenure with with Irvin. Right. Um, and, and basically, as I started learning more and more about resonant frequencies and the Helmholtz response of a, of a given sized object mm. and the effects of porting on the Helmholtz response of an object, I realized, eh, I don't know about the whole sound port thing. Because basically you're you're putting like a six inch sound hole on a guitar, right? Unless you very carefully, which is totally doable, you unless you very carefully calculate the size of the port and then adjust the top sound hole accordingly, so that you have an aperture of the same, you know, square, whatever measurement, right? The same area. That's the mm. word. Uh, but even at that, by moving holes around on the object, it does affect the helm holes. So. Even if you have a hole, putting it in one area of the upper bout, it'll have zero effect. And putting it in another area of the upper bout or lower bout, it will have a dramatic effect and not necessarily mm. good. So I stopped doing that. And on the second guitar, I told Andy, by the way, I don't offer the sound port anymore. Or, or sorry, no, he said, oh, the only thing I want is don't put the sound port on the guitar. And then I said, oh, really interesting. And then I just told him what I told you. I no longer hmm. offer it. And I asked him why he didn't want it. He said, in live performance, it's too hard for him to control the feedback. And he would always end up right. duct taping over, you know, feedback busting the, the sound port. Mm -hmm. that, makes so sense. that was also a very interesting, you know, learning from our, our artists. He's a guy who's out there in the trenches every day doing it. I don't want to say for real, but doing it on large stages at mm. big SPLs and dealing with feedback and the sound in the room is a reality for performing artists. So Absolutely. yes, I don't do that. And the other thing is I, I, after I developed the fan for Tony McManus, the dad gad fan, I used that for Andy instead of the original one was 25 to 27 inches. Yes, and, I remember that. And it was great for his tuning down to low A, but as he developed as a player, he said he really plays mostly in and around Dadgad these days mm -hmm. or those days. That was his response. And for the one tune, maybe two a night that he'd go down to a B or an A, it was fine. With that long scale on the bass side, it was fine. So his guitars all now have my Dadgad fan on them and have... I don't know, since 2010, probably. Absolutely. Those well, they, they, they both make perfect sense, uh, which brings me on to our next topic, which is fan frets and or multi-scale instruments. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't get away with this because you are known as one of the world's leading uh, experts, really, because there's a lot of people offering them. In fact, mm -hmm. the... The number of luthiers offering a fan fret, I would imagine, almost outweighs the number of luthiers not offering a fan fret yeah. <laughs> these days. Um, now, you've gone deep with this subject, uh, and I know that for some builders, it's very tempting just to put a slightly different 
a fretboard on and a slightly angled bridge and then that's it. But your belief has always started with the bracing and the voicing of the instrument, let alone the, uh, the fretwork afterwards, hasn't it? Uh, well, it goes back to the beginning of our conversation. First, you have to go to a museum. So fan fret instruments, I mean, that's 16th century stuff, mm. late 16th century, the uh, Orpharian was the guitar mm -hmm. version. They are both members of the Citrine family. And there was another Bandora. Yeah, Bandora, which was like tuned to C or B. It was a, a much longer scale version also in the Citrine family. So it's a 500 year old instrument. It, it, it's it's not new. And, and as I said earlier, there's really nothing new. But then in the late 80s, like 87, 89, uh, Ralph Novak, had already been working with it for a while, sort of did the homework, also probably went to museum and started applying it to electric basses and electric guitars. And mm. he got the patent on it. And Ralph is the, I used to license it from him. And Ralph is the fellow who explained to me how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've built at least 150 fan fret instruments by now. So as with everything else, we were talking about that process of research and development. Well, one at a time, 150 guitars, you, you learn a lot. And yes, you look at the placement of the bridge and the fingerboard and you know the skewed headstock and a few other things. Cutting an accurate fretboard, and I have mine CNC cut because the resolution is to two ten thousandths of an inch. Right. I used to cut them by hand, <laughs> you know, but, and, and now I, I have them CNC. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, a super accurate fretboard is a really good place to start for the intonation. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the guitar is guitar making. I mean, there are certain principles. You, you need to place the X brace underneath the bridge in a certain way. And sometimes that means the X brace needs to be asymmetric, but bracing a top is bracing a top. You know, there's a lot less voodoo than, than people think. And I watched your interview with Jason and, you know, mm. he said it very, very well. It, it, it's, it's no one thing. The, the guitar is a system and it's every single, you know, it's the fretboard and the neck angle and the bridge and the weight of the bridge and the height of the bridge and, uh, how your neck is made and the density of the top and the deflection of the braces and the movement of the back. It's every single one of those things influences everything else within the system. Mm -hmm. um, so the fan fret guitars, I guess for the guitar makers who may be, you know, tuned in the most, this was given to me by, you know, the wonderful Jeff Trogan. Mm. Uh, many years ago, when I was getting ready to build, you know, my first few fan fret guitars, I just said, what should I be thinking about? And he said, you need to remember that you're skewing the bridge, yeah. which is a giant brace, and mm -hmm. it adds an incredible amount of stiffness to the top. So there you go. For the guitar makers... Keep that in mind. You're stiffening the top when you fan the bridge, when you skew the bridge, Absolutely. and the rest of it is the rest of it is is voicing and guitar making. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask my last question now. But if anybody else uh, would like to chime in with one, uh, do drop a comment here. Um, you your guitars have a North American sound, but it's a sound that I would uh, also describe as as typically Canadian. Um, I feel that in the timbre of your instruments and in certainly uh, other luthiers from the Larive school as well, you know, you've, you've got a real depth to the sound. Um, how would, would you agree with that? Do you think there is a, a Canadian sound as opposed to a, a United States sound? I'm definitely not making a traditional North American, let's say Martin Gibson, Washburn style x brace guitar. You know, I'm not making guitars in that family. Most people know I make lattice braced instruments. And even my GF, which is my most, you know, traditional 
uh, braced guitar. It's far, f the, the bracing on it is anything but, you know, Martin Gibson. Um, to quote, you know, Bob Taylor, the most important aspect to the voice of the guitar is the body shape. Mm. And if I remember correctly, because I heard him speak at uh, an Asia symposium in the mid 1990s. And, you know, he said, and it's a great analogy. He said, you could take a J200 and an L00 and brace them exactly the same. And you can play around with the depth of the sides all day long. That L00 is never going to sound like a J200 or mm -hmm. vice versa. So the body shape is a contributing factor to the sound. Uh, my mentors and, and now close friends and, and the people I learn from and look up to are, of course, Grit Laskin and, and Linda Manzer and Mark Benito and Sergey de Young and, and you know, those people were informed by the great John Larive, of course. And if my understanding, I mean, Jimmy Quisto did this somewhat, but my understanding is that when Mr. Larive started building uh, steel string guitars, and I could be wrong, but this is my understanding. He, to that point, had been, he was a disciple of Ed, uh, Monk, the classical guitar mm. maker. Yeah. And he took the classical body and he kind of pushed it out, you know, altered the mold. Uh, De Quisto used to open and close his molds to make, you know, 16, 17, 18 inch guitars. So mm. I basically took my classical guitar and opened up the mold. So, you know, if you look at my G1, which was my first original design, and just next time you see a picture of my G1, just think about the shape of a like a Ramirez and right. imagine, you know, just <laughs> blowing it up or, or opening up the mold. So that's how I got my G1 shape. And wow. then I did the same thing for the G2, which was my next guitar, their sequential numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, basically, that's it. So I think that, you know, the, the Canadian guitar makers, the ones that we're talking about, I'm guessing, probably, you know, they were making their body shapes in similar ways, or they were heavily influenced by their time in Larivé shop, just as the Samaji disciples, those guitars all have a distinct look. Mm. And that body shape, absolutely influences the voice of the instrument. So I think more so than anything else, the personality and the, the timbre of my guitars comes from that body shape. Cool. And then the responsiveness, that, that comes from, you know, what's under the hood. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Alexander Winstead asks, I've been saving to purchase one of your guitars. Yay. Uh, how, yay. <laughs> how long do you see yourself in the business? That's a, that's a question everyone has to ask. It's a great question. And uh, if, if my partner Judy is watching, she's laughing right now. So the exit strategy <laughs> for most guitar makers that I know of is basically death. <laughs> right. So, you know, most guitar makers don't have hedge funds and retirement plans. And I'm no different. I'm just, I, I've busted my ass for, you know, 25 years now. And I'm fortunate I'm living from my craft and, and my business is strong. Things are great. Mm -hmm. uh, but it took me a long time to get here. And, you know, I'm going to be hobbling around as long as I can. So I'm hoping... If I can shuffle around for another 20 years, that would be great. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> it gives me yeah. a chance to save up as well. <laughs> well, listen, Michael, thank you so much for your time. It, it's been an absolute joy to, to speak with you, uh, as always. Okay, Tom Sands wants, to, wants us to very quickly talk us through the perfect espresso. Oh. Yeah. This is serious. Well, finally, we get to the real Finally, we subject. get to that, which is truly important. Right at the end. <laughs> Espresso, you know, it, it, it's all the same. You were talking about my unwillingness to compromise. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's it's like making guitars. First, you have to really understand what is it that's a great coffee. 
Mm. And what is it that you like in coffee? You know, right now there's this whole single origin. Sorry, that's not my thing. I'm an old school espresso kind of a guy. It's a blend mm. and it's, it's anything but single origin. And, you know, it's like I'm going two and a half, 2.3 to one ratio. For those who brew coffee, you'll understand mm. what that is. But freshly ground and you like making guitar you need to have a recipe mm. you know fresh beans get the you know get the dose right get the grind right have a decent coffee machine uh you know consistency the, the person who's making you have all of the same elements and two different people making the coffee and the coffee is going to taste different absolutely so uh just like guitar making just get good at it <laughs> well on that note i mean that is fantastic advice for anybody in any walk of life michael thank you so much for your time today it's been a it's been a joy to talk to you as ever my friend it's been a thrill and so nice to see you and hopefully not too distant future uh, we won't be whatever it is eight thousand kilometers apart that's right let's do this again soon take care of yourself okay, be well stay safe everybody thanks for all the best me. bye everyone mm -hmm.